Hi, how's everybody? Hello. How are you doing? Good. Hey, Seth, what's up? Been a while. <laughs> Seth, are you there? Oh, he left. Oh, there you go. Give me a second to set up. Hi, Dr. Wood. I miss Hi, you, buddy. You I miss you too, bro. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are back. We'll wait a couple minutes before we get started. How's your semester going so far? Day number two. Hi. <laughs> Busy with classes? Yeah, nice to see you again. You too. <laughs> yeah, did you have a good break? Actually, I took a winter class. Oh, you did? I took a, a psychology class. Oh, that's fantastic. I just finished two online classes as well. <clears throat> um, so, right now, I'm taking 30B and mm -hmm. D. I'm thinking, oh, okay. I'm thinking about I drop a D because maybe I too many classes. Oh, too many classes? Because I, well, have, I have a CAS 1A because oh, okay. they, they always ask this as a request. <laughs> yeah, it, that should be an easy A though. That's a Microsoft Office intro to yeah. computer class. Yeah, that's a easy, but I saw that the schedule. It was a lot of homework. Yeah, well, yeah. you know how it is. Three to four unit classes, they're always a lot of work. Um, yeah, and, um, and the CS1A, uh, that's a teach, teacher uh, don't set up Zoom. He just ask us, read the book, chapter one, like homework or what, uh, put on the canvas, like that. For CIS? 30 one, D? A. No, 1A. 1A? What do you have for 1A? Yeah, I'm thinking to have a D. Then, then Who do I, you have for 1A? Yeah, uh, this semester I have class CS 1A, this class 30B and 30D. Okay, and then, Who, and who's then, your teacher for 1A? I go. Hi. Okay. Well, when will you when you look, let me know. All right, everybody. Hi, welcome back. See familiar faces. Glad you made it back. Um, they're not canceling my section, which is good. Uh, I might pick up another section because there's some mishap with faculty, of course. Um, anyway, um, so I found out that my grandmother in Virginia is passing, so I might need to fly to Virginia. Uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks, but I'm not intending to cancel any classes. So I might fly out for the weekend and then come back. It's crazy right now just to get flights. And so, but I will let you know. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to hear um, that. Yeah, I, you know, we were hoping that she's better, but this is uh, two consecutive year I'm, I'm losing. I lost another grandmother last year. And so to COVID and then this year, I'm, I have another death in the family. So um, I will go over the course requirement. And then this week, we're just going to touch on networking because we are going to get on to some of the cloud resources. If you have gone through the book, um, you know, I'm going to try. I tried getting on Cisco Viral yesterday and it was a little laggy. So I'm going to try again. And then um, I intend for you to even have equipment down the line. So they're working on that, trying to see uh, if you can use networking equipment to loan and then uh, to bring it back at the end of the semester. So I'm gonna talk about the course requirement. And then if you have any question, please let me know, okay? So let's go into screen sharing. Okay, so this is the second Python in this series. That's exciting. Um, if you do take the 30D with this class, 
Um, I, we intend to offer the 30E and the 30C. So we will finish out the Python series in less than two years. So that will be three semester. But if you don't take the D, um, we will probably re-offer it again later on. And that class is supposed to be taught with Raspberry Pi and we do have Raspberry Pi for the student. But for this class, you're gonna be learning about Python scripting for networking. We're gonna touch a little bit on security throughout. And then there is another Python course that's mainly focused on cybersecurity. And that course is gonna touch on ethical hacking. I intend to teach that class. Um, that is really my wheelhouse. Um, so I, you know, so after this class, you can take 30C and the other class, which is going to be the advanced Python to finish out the certificate. Um, so as you look at Canvas, we have some resource information just to go over some course information here. Let me minimize the people real quick. Um, this is a three unit course. And we are gonna have regular meeting uh, every week on Monday and Wednesday, since we have the holiday on Monday. We're not gonna, we're gonna not do lab this week, but because there's le less lab hours, we should be able to have all the lab hours requirement complete. Um, I intend to make the second day the lab day, um, and then the first day more of the lecture and assignment day. So on, on Wednesdays, when we usually do a little bit more scripting and uh, sometime we will do some scripting on Monday, but that will just, you know, preview for the Wednesday. We meet from two to 4.10. Um, if we finish a little bit early, that's okay. I do have office hours about 4.30 to 5.30. So if you have questions, you can join the office hours. It's a different link on Zoom. Um, by the end of this course, there are three things that you will be able to achieve. Establish communication across network devices using script programs written in Python language. Uh, the second thing is you are gonna be able to write script in Python um, for system process automation. And the third things are gonna be utilizing modules and packages, libraries and building your modules and packages um, or use the pre-built one to create programs for network services and system administration. This is a perfect course to take if you're looking to do system administration, network administration and security uh, administration. So. We are gonna get into a little bit more development um, in the next week, but we are gonna touch on networking this week. So Zoom class information is here. If you're new to my Zoom environment, I don't use Confer. Um, I gave up my license last year when I did CyberCamp and they have a hard time to reissue the license to Confer and Confer is pretty, even though it's through Zoom because it's the license for Confer as everybody gets on it, it's a little slower. So I'm, uh, I have a pro and I use it. I pay for additional uh, storage. So I push my video on YouTube in case you miss the class, you can check out my YouTube channel. It's organized in all playlists. So each class will have its own playlist and I will also link it to Canvas. Uh, for the syllabus, you can download or preview the syllabus inside the page. Um, as we talked about how this is um, an on a face-to-face -face class via Zoom. Let me open my, oh, maybe I didn't, oh, there it is, sorry. Okay, so here is the content. We already talked about the course information. Um, the content, we are gonna cover networking. We're gonna use networking knowledge um, and be able to write scripts. Now, I recommend taking CIS 40A, which will likely be offered either this summer or the, the next, um, the, in the next semester, because that is gonna give you more understanding of how the networks are supposed to be configured, working with different devices. We will touch on some of the concept in this class, but it will not go in depth 
like what it would be in a Network Plus class, or you won't be able to configure the router and switches as much. This class is mainly using network concepts and writing script for network devices. Um, so we are gonna use um, Python 3. I know that the textbook mentioned that, you know, there are some libraries that work with Python 2, but as you know, Python 2 is no longer supported as part as since last January. Um, so what we are gonna be using is we are gonna use Python 3. So now you can use online interpreter, but I think it would be better if you utilize um, if you utilize your, your installation on your system and an IDE of your choice. I'm open to any IDE you like, or you can use idle, which comes with the installation. So we'll take a look at some of the very basics starting today. We'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, review about numbers, operators, uh, looking at, you know, flow control, and then talking a little bit about the modules. I think in my last class, I don't really emphasize packages too much, but I walk you through on how to create modules and you can build a group of modules to be included in a folder um, and you can treat it as a, as a package. Um, so that way you can utilize that to efficiently run your program. Um, and so we are gonna work with command line interface, especially Cisco. Um, and we are going to use the virtual environment. So please be patient with the free resources that's online. Um, I'm going to try to work out something with MVC where you can check out some equipment. Um, they might not loan the, the actual Cisco switches that are super expensive, but what we can do is we can probably look at some of the smaller appliances for you to check out and you'll be able to use the CLI with those. So there will be some command lines and Cisco command lines are similar to what you've seen in most command lines, but they use different commands. So it will take a little bit to get used to. Um, and then you will build script to work with um, the interfaces for these appliances. We're gonna look, we're gonna work on SSH. Um, and, <clears throat> and also starting next week, we're gonna work with pexpect. So using these libraries, you are gonna be able to um, configure systems, even you know, monitor systems and you know, looking at the network traffic and things like that. So here it talks about some of the libraries that we're gonna to be touching on. And for Ansible architecture, I know that Ansible in the past, they had written it for Python 2. I know that they have updated it, but I haven't revisited it, but I will work on that and then work out the lab for you. Um, we don't have Juniper or some of the Forarista. However, we do have um, Fortinet and the other appliances. So we will work with the other vendors, okay? Um, then we will touch on network security. Um, looking at how we can do port scan. If you ever participate in the National Cyber League, like Chris and some of the other students in the class, you probably have seen some of this being used. Um, but if you have not, this will be a good introduction on how you can pen test. Um, you know, we won't go in depth into pen testing, but some of the technique that you can use to really test your network and your systems and also to block the traffic, right? We can look at whitelisting, uh, blacklisting, and then how to set up um, virtual local area network. And Cisco appliances, that's their specialty is to be able to use layer four switches and, and be able to set up VLANs. And um, the cool thing about VLANs is that you can have the people, right? The system connected to your network and you can separate them so that way there are there are more protection to those systems, um, and also you know the security emphasis and also in in the permission and access so you can manage it a little bit better. Um, so now saying that right, um, Cisco is not very uniform in their appliances across. The majority of the appliances use the same command. And then there are some appliances that have other commands 
um, depending on the versions and when that those appliances are released. So keep that in mind. So when you go through and you're trying to work with the network devices and write the script, you have to really look at Cisco and vendor information about that particular device. And that's a good practice for the field um, as they are different, even though they come from the same vendor. Um, they've been a little bit better in the more recent years about that, but my experience with Cisco appliances has always been a mix. Um, they change things through time and then don't, they don't they don't go back and make things more versatile or using the same command for the older appliances. So, um, and then we will do some analysis. I know that uh, we had an opportunity in my regular session for the fall where I, uh, I made it available for the student to, uh, you know, do the project doing analysis. So we'll touch a little bit more analysis because in, in as, part, as part of the administration process, you have to really automate a lot of these things so that way you can easily report. And looking at logs is so important in networking and, and cybersecurity. So we will um, take a look at those things, okay? Filtering logs, um, and you can do a lot of this in Python because there are abundant, li there are libraries for you to use. Um, and then we'll take a look at the framework and the APIs um, and then the touching back with routing firewall, um, looking at your packets, monitoring your systems and your network. Um, and so there's a vast amount of things that we're going to try to achieve and it's going to be highly technical. So I'm going to take you for a roller coaster ride. So be prepared. <laughs> um, and so, and then we're gonna take a look at, you know, we're gonna use viral, we're gonna use device control and, and, uh, and then we, we will take a look at the WebSocket and JSON um, and how to integrate the monitoring process and encryption process um, as far as connection and, and so forth. So as you can see in cybersecurity, it's a very wide field, right? Um, the more technical knowledge that you equip yourself with, the, the more versatile you're gonna be. And even if you get onto the development side of the house, um, every software needs some form of security component, right? We, I do analysis with applications frequently and, and every systems need connection. So there gotta be somebody that's configuring all of this, that write the scripts, that writes the program for this. So this is a good way to start gaining that type of knowledge. Um, any questions so far? Okay, we talked about um, student Sorry. learning. Sorry. Yes. How and, or, or when, or where'd you learn all this stuff from? So learning on this stuff as in what stuff? Are you talking about networking or are you talking about cybersecurity or? Well, Python in relation to all this. As far as my own experience or? Yes. Okay. So um, throughout working, um, a lot of the times I'm self-taught. So I, when I was in school, Python started to become more prevalent, but not as it is today. Um, I had learned on Visual Basic <laughs> and C and some of the older languages, but as you understand programming concepts, right? Introducing a, a different programming language is not difficult. Um, I had gained knowledge with JavaScript um, at, through just you know, reading books, uh, do, working on the job, um, things like that, along with Python. And I transitioned from, you know, version two to version three, um, because when I started seeing that there is more demand for this, and so that's when I, I started incorporating as part of your curriculum. Um, a lot of the things I've learned, even with virtual machines, things like that, I have gained it either through experience or that was more on the side thing where I gained knowledge. Graduate school and doctorate school and you know undergrad school, they're gonna give you the basics, 
um, in the doctorate area, they really just touch on, you know, researching and looking at technology that's going to be unique, um, that's needed. But they really, you know, I had like one, a couple advanced software engineering classes through my master's and then going into more like security policies, emphasis, um, regulations and stuff like that in the doctorate area. Um, but so what I like for you to do is I want to encourage you to take advantage of the apprenticeship program, um, uh, Loma Linda Hospital and some of the, the, the local companies have opened up the opportunity for students. Um, I do have another opportunity coming up that's going to be purely for programming and development. Um, that's going to be with um, the Inland Empire region. So we're working with multiple cities. Um, and this is a side thing that I just started getting into with one of my colleagues. So I would tie it back to Moreno Valley College and it will be like, you know, part of the apprenticeship or the internship opportunity for students. So um, watch out for that. And if you're looking to do apprenticeship, I am running CIS 200 right now. And um, also make sure that you start preparing for maybe getting certifications, right? Like uh, Python certifications, if you're ready, it's free for you until January. I can only get the license for this year. And then we're trying to find funding for the upcoming year. So um, watch out for that. I think I put that in the announcement. So hopefully I answered your questions. Um, on and off, like before I started teaching more regularly, um, I was a sys admin, I was a network admin, um, I was a field technician, I, I did assessment for many hospital and company and healthcare facility, and I still try to pick that up. But, you know, MVC keeps me pretty busy. So um, right now, the technical side is a little bit on back burner. <laughs> but eventually we will get more, I will get back into that. So um, as far as textbook, this is the book that I'm using. Um, it's one of the better books for this type of class. And um, if you actually read about the author, he'd been in this type of uh, industry and this is what he's been doing for over 20 years. Um, you know, from, from uh, Silicon Valley all the way to Seattle, um, so he'd been with many of the cloud companies along with some of the, the um, regular organization as well, okay? So expectation in this class, you will need to spend outside of class hours between 12 to 14, that's estimated, on assignment quiz projects um, and various tasks. Um, I organize everything as a module, so that would represent a unit per week. And we're going to try to address um, mostly one chapter per week, but there will be some weeks that we will pick up and do a couple chapters. I intend to finish the majority of the textbook. So it, it utilize your investment in the textbook or um, now if you use the older version of the textbook, it actually used the older, uh, the version two of the Python, but this one actually used uh, version three. Okay, and if you bought the book, I think um, even if the ebook, you can find the link where you can download his scripts so you can take a look at his scripts. Okay, I do take late work um, a week late, that's going to be 10% deduction. Two weeks late, that's going to be 20% deduction. Um, anything uh, above three weeks, I do not take. But in any case, if there's emergency like work, um, where you haven't been able to access the courses for a couple of weeks, make sure you drop me an email and let me know. I'll work with you. Um, I'm, I'm pretty flexible in, in that part. Um, unless it's like the last day of class, right? And uh, you're letting me know that you can't, you can't, you know, submit stuff from week six, then, you know, there's, there's not a lot I could do. Uh, but make sure that we communicate. So assignments is gonna be some activities we're gonna be doing in the class. I'll walk you through all the assignments. Um, and then, you know, the emphasize of the, we want to focus on the hands-on part of it. So we will do that. 
And I usually don't require the assignment to be due the day off. I used to when, when for a long time, for many, many years. And now I'm a little bit more lenient. Um, so we, it will be due two days after we, we started the assignment. And in any case, if it, there needs to be time, I will, adjust, well, I will adjust the due date, okay? The course project, uh, course project will be due at the end of the semester. Um, I will release the course project a little bit sooner. I want you to have some practice to start going, um, and then I will start releasing the project. Surveys came back with all the classes for the last couple of semester. The student they want the project to be released sooner, uh, especially for my inner session because it's so short. But um, so I'm gonna try to release it a little bit earlier and then kind of you know preview you how to go about addressing the, the course project. I highly, I highly recommend working with other people. Um, I did put in the discussion for this week that we should think about working in teams um, and set your expectation as a team member. So think about working with another individual or perhaps two, but I think two to three would be adequate for the course project. Um, quizzes and exam, we will have periodic quiz. There will only be one final exam. I do not give midterm. Um, your course project really is the, a way that I can assess it and I would see it a little bit better than just answering multiple choice question. So the final exam will be multiple choice. Um, the quizzes will be multiple choice, and then we have the course project component for assessment. So quizzes are usually due by Sunday, 11.59, and I will open it for the week. So, <clears throat> you know, you have the entire week to uh, go through the quiz. Or if it is open a little later, I do normally give you a week to finish it. Okay, you have three attempts. For online participation, um, since this class is kind of like a hybrid, we meet on Zoom and we participate via Canvas. So um, your attendance, I can measure that based on your class task completion. So I might not post attendance like I used to before right away the day of, but I will look at um, you know what you had, have achieved in a week and then that will wait in your attendance as well. For um, your grade category, I use the standard scale. Uh, 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, 70 to 79 is a C, 60 to 69 is a D, and below 59 is an F. Um, to pass the course at community college, you have to get a C or better. And if you attend class and if you complete the task that's required, likely that you will get a good grade in the class. Um, let's shoot for that, okay? Uh, your grade is broken down into different categories. Your quizzes are gonna be 15% where we will have about three quizzes. Um, assignments and participation will be 30%. Your lab activities will be 20%. Um, and your course project is 15% and your exam is 20%. So that will total 100%, okay? Any question regarding grades, assignments? Okay, uh, next part is student code of conduct. Um, I follow the college standard policy. Um, the process would be, you know, we file a form in any case of misconduct. It goes to student services, then the dean for student services and sometime academic dean if it, if it ties to academic. Um, and Dean of Instructions or VP of Academics, sometimes they would advise the student. Um, and then that form of advice will go into the student file. Uh, for attendance and participation, I reserve the right to drop the student if they miss class consecutive weeks and if they don't participate. Um, if the student decide to drop the course, make sure that we check out the timeline on WebAdvisor so that way we don't have um, repercussion with the grades. After the deadline, um, sometimes I would just let the student earn the grade that they, they receive in the class. 
because a lot of the times as a student, um, you know, you should know when you, you want to remain in the course or drop the course, things like that. So sometime if it's closer more than halfway, I would let the, I would let that ride, but it, you know, it all depends on the scenario. Um, behavior issue, just respect each other. I respect you. So I have the same expectation from you. Um, avoid any crazy conflict. If you have any problem, please come to me. Um, if you can't communicate with me in class, you can send me an email. You can make an appointment to see me. You can see me during office hours. Um, just avoid offensive feelings. We want it to be diverse, a healthy learning environment. Um, for cheating policy, uh, want to make sure you do your own work. Um, I have not been too strict about this. I will start cracking down a little bit on this a little bit more. Um, I do use, you know, checker tools, but making sure even if uh, you get suggestion or feedback from other people, even other groups, right? T write your own script. That's really important for me because I want to measure uh, your grade is really based on your capability, right? And I want to make sure that you're ready for the field. We don't want to produce someone that is not ready for the field. I vouch for you when I tell the employers that you are ready when I write that letter of recommendation. So I want to make sure that you're ready. So um, if you need to utilize online resources or references, make sure that you have proper citations. Check with me if you're not sure, okay? Um, and don't wait till the last minute to do it and then just throw it in there and it becomes a whole big ordeal. Um, so making sure that we follow the guidelines and in universities, um, one, one attempt would just be a termination period. They don't tolerate that. Um, I've had an, a student that went through that. Um, he ended up not finishing at UCR because his roommate took his code and submitted it um, to the professors and the TA caught it and he can never come back to UCR again. So, you know, we don't want that to happen and we want to make sure that there's integrity um, in our work. If you need special accommodation, please uh, touch base with the SPS contact Melody. You can find them in the library building. I think they work remotely, but there would be someone there in case. Um, and also you can call them, you can visit the website and contact them, okay? If you call this phone number, it, this actually goes to my voicemail for the MVC phone. The best way to get a hold of me is via email. I usually respond pretty quickly uh, unless I'm tied up in crazy meetings or something happens. But um, in any case, I will respond within 24 hours. My office hours are here. Uh, Monday and Wednesday, I do 4.30 to 5.30. Um, and then Tuesday and Thursday, I have 11 to 1 p.m. I do have obligations with a committee, like curriculum committee <clears throat> and other things. That's part of my job. Um, so between 1 and 4 on Tuesday, if I don't pick up that, that six class, um, I will be in, in committee, uh, doing committee work, okay? And I'm working on a lot of different curriculum right now, just to let you know that uh, data science is coming. We're doing a, a, a project with UCR and we're replicating some of the materials that UCR is teaching along with UC Berkeley at the statistic intro level. Um, and then there's some Python component with it. So it will be an associate degree to transfer along with a certificate called data analytics. Um, it has been approved with the region for the certificate um, to start the process. So it's going to take us about a year and a half to get it through chancellor office. If you need an appointment, send me an email or a message two hours in advance. Um, I will let you know if I'm available at the time that you request. Friday is the best day to make an appointment for me. Um, 
it's a day that I, I do a lot of like, you know, scheduling and, and assistant chair work, but I will make time to, to meet with you if you need. But the other days, um, if you need to meet in the morning or outside of class, just let me know. Okay. Any question regarding syllabus? I go to see you uh, during your office hour, so I don't need to make appointment. Right. Yeah. And you might have to wait. If I'm with another student, I will put a message in Zoom, um, you know, and then once the student leaves. So it's like first come, first serve. But if, if you want for sure, right, like let me know. We can schedule something. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so with that, we will start talking about networking. My favorite, well, my second favorite things is networking. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so this week, oh, also just before we start, I'm sorry. The content for most of the syllabus stuff is here. Um, there's a course plan, which is like an outline of what we're gonna be going through each week. I will edit it throughout the semester. So if you wanted to, to know what we should be doing, there should also be a page in each module telling you the tasks that you need to accomplish. The Q&A here, you can post your question there. If you want me or other students to answer, if it, it's a private question, just send me a message. Um, if you need Office 365, you can find the information here for download, okay? All right, so for us this week, we are gonna post a self-introduction um, I wanted it that there so that way you can, you know, who is who, um, you know, what, what, you know, what are they capable of, how do they work in teams, and then that way you can also pick your team. Um, I haven't, you know, assigned team via Canvas for since I started Moreno Valley College. I've done that in the past at the other institutions. Uh, but I want you to have the liberty to pick your people, but you know that in a workplace, you just work with whoever that's there and you got to make sure that, you know, you hold up and manage the team accordingly. Um, you know, you can't fire your teammate, but sometimes you can report them. So if you have problem with your teams, make sure you let me know, right? And then you do have an opportunity to assess them. Okay, so read chapter one, not too bad. Um, it's all about networking for most part. Um, I posted some notes, uh, so check out the notes. We're gonna talk about that right now and then we're gonna complete the assignments. So, and then I will try to respond to the discussion when I can this week. So this is the notes. Let me get my files open, which is... <clears throat> and I know Michelle took my non-credit class. So this might be review for you. And then if you took my CIS 27 class in the past, this also might be a little bit of review for you. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good to review and talk a little bit more about network. So as you heard earlier, I started my career as a field technician. I installed many appliances and equipment. It took the manager a few months before he trusted me <laughs> with switches uh, and things like that, because for a long time he said, oh yeah, just bring the computer, install it, you know, connect them, um, and then there will be somebody else. So I gradually worked my way up uh, with the networking experience, and then I became a network and system admin later on. So. To start, the, the notes touch on the internet, right? And we know that the internet is a collection of networks. And, you know, at home, you have a home network, which is a very small scale network. Some people, they would have a business from home, right? They might have a small server running from home. And if you're looking at the larger scale, that will be an enterprise. So when we're looking at you know, it could be large or small networks connecting together. And it would look something like this, right? You have mobile devices connecting to the, the access points, the wireless access point. And then even with the smaller company, 
um, you would have these computers and systems. There's a PDA here. We don't use PDA anymore. That would be uh, smartphones and tablets. Um, and then you might have phone system. And phone system is a big area that we have to manage as well, part of the network. And then there might be, you know, a couple servers. Now, if you're looking at the physical piece of this, right, the server, the switch, the switch might be in various part of the facility. Um, let's say that we have a small office um, that have maybe 10 employees, right? You might have a switch that's located somewhere in the office near the cubicle, and that might be a dummy switch. So when I say a dummy switch, its job is just to connect all the systems together, switch the data, send the data to more of an advanced, smarter switch. And the smarter switch, the router, the firewall, and even the server, right? And you know the switch for the phone, right? The communication appliances, and you know things like that would be on a rack in some kind of closet, or they, if it's fancier, they would have like a server room that's going to be larger. But this is a small scale, so they might have a closet size area, and they would put a rack in there, and then they would have these appliances. So the router would go in there and then they might have a firewall appliance. Some of the router would have the firewall capability uh, and then you would have a, a smarter switch where you can control things like virtual local area network and then you would connect the dummy switch to that switch, right? The, the simple switch. We don't use hub anymore, but we use like level two switch for, I call the dummy switch. And then we got the server. Now <clears throat> the wireless access point, they have to run a cable back to the smart switch, the main switch. Um, and sometimes that switch is capable of uplink. Sometimes they're not, then it would have a separate appliance that will be for uplink that would send all the data to the router. And the router, Sometimes they're very large. The old one is very big, like the Cisco, but the newer ones, the fiber ones, they're tiny. And on the router, when you look at it and you can find pictures online, there's usually only a couple of ports, right? You have one port that's going to go from the main switch to it, and then an, an out port that's going to go to the fiber box or you know, the, the line that's, that's connected from the internet service provider. So inside our network here, this is called the local area network and the internet, the cloud, right? All that is, is that you're gonna connect to other networks like internet service provider. So for a business, they can use like AT&T, Cox, Charter, Spectrum, you know, you name it, the ones that surface in the area. Um, and then, they, you know, the communication company, they would have their own sets of appliances, right? And cabling that's gonna connect to your particular area. Um, so anything beyond the router that's con considered public to us, right? That's considered outside of, of our ownership. The company would own it, the components that's inside the local area network, therefore, as an administrator, a, a security specialist, a, a network technician, you have to manage these components within, right? The IT support people, this is their level, right? Troubleshooting some of this, the network technician, this is their level. The security technicians and the higher, this is their level. And then the overall like manager, they would look at everything. Okay, so that kind of broke it into different level. <clears throat> and sometimes they have two levels here, two levels here and so forth, you get the point. All right, so here it touches a little bit more on your internet service provider. And this is, I added some stuff that's not in the book so you can visually see it. Um, and when you're looking at internet service provider, typically, you know, you pay, 
uh, the you know monthly or yearly, and it it aggregates out to the larger network. So if you're talking about Spectrum, right, they would have their network appliances connections, and you know so when you subscribe to them, you are um, a, a a customer of them, you are a member of that that network technically. So your little network at home is part of their larger network. Um, now, when you see the connection between the communication company, so let's say that I live in Moreno Valley and my area is serviced by Spectrum, right? Uh, formerly Time Warner um, before, and also, you know, in this area, you can use like, um, what is that? It used to be Verizon. And then now you can have other fiber company that subscribe. But you would see like AT&T or other, other provider. So how do they connect? They actually use router to communicate with each other, okay? And, and so what we would have is we would have a group of networks that is unified in routing policy. This is why when you go from, when you, you surf on the web or you visit website, right? Basically your traffic, your packet, your request comes from your computer. And once it leaves your wireless router at home, it gets passed to your internet service provider, which passes to what we see as autonomous system, your AS. And these are just a group of routers that's gonna say, you know, it's either first come first serve, right? Um, or the fastest path first, it's kind of like pointing the direction for that packet to go to get to the web, the web server the fastest way as possible, okay? So you would see different groups and sometimes, right? You would have companies that own multiple ASs and then some company that owns less. For example, Cox and Charter, they own a lot in the United States, right? And then outside of the country, you would have other companies that operate that own the communication lines and, and their AS. Um, and these, they get registered to the associations for that region, right? Like for us, it's North America and these communication company, they have to register the public IP information for these devices, right? The name for these devices and so forth. So that way they can service you. Um, and so from the security standpoint, we can, we can find out information about these, right? So how does an attacker really go from, you know, their system to other networks without being seen is that they do a lot of investigation to really bypass some of these systems because when you start from your computer and you travel, right, your packets travel to other locations, you leave footprint because ultimately it needs to call home. It needs to come back to your system. It needs to respond to where is the source. So all of these systems, right, it generates some kind of tracking like it's passing through. So if we need to follow someone or trace or investigate, we would start with, you know, the, the, the targeted area or, or the impacted system, and then we would follow it through. And when you get into the domain of communication company, you have to have court order and Chris took my forensic class. So, and then you, you got to request all of these things. And if they release the information, it will take a little bit of time. So, um, so that kind of give you an idea or, you know, the big picture on how we connect to the internet and how all of our systems are really communicating um, across the world. So, when you hear the term host, <coughs> host can be any nodes, okay? Usually people refer to host as a computer, a system, could be a server, right? Um, and that nodes would com communicate with other nodes. So if I have a PC, right, like a desktop PC, that could be a host. So when you, you hear the term host base or host system, that's a system. So when they say host-based firewall, that's a software application that's installed on that system, 
right? And that's different than the firewall appliance, which is, you know, an actual device that's going to filter screen, that's going to block, right? Or accept, et cetera. Um, so with the Internet of Things, and Internet of Things can go from a smart thermostat to your Echo to, you know, your Google Nest to everything, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, health and so those things can are, are also part of your network because they're wirelessly connected. Uh, the majority of them are all wirelessly connected. In healthcare facility, you have heart monitoring system, you know, patient care equipment that are IoT. Um, and then in businesses, you have internet cameras, like your IP cameras uh, for surveillance, even your TV at home. So when we, we start doing inventory of our network, we have to take a look at, you know, how our nodes are connected right, what kind of services are being used by these connections. And that's part of the administration process. Um, because what if you are in charge of the network and, you know, this is a manufacturing company and they have tons of IP camera for surveillance, right? Um, like something like even warehouse, like Amazon would have that. And so that way they would track things like anti-theft, um, they would do image recognition, a lot of different things. So what you have to do is you have to be able to manage them. Number one, get them connected and make sure they're available. Number two, when you push updates for firmware, you have to find ways to automate it, right? Um, so this is when Python start to come in is because that way you can say, okay, this is the, the, the updates that you need to push and you just write the script in order to, to push that to all the receiving camera um, instead of going one by one to do it. Okay, so it streamlined the process for us. So let's talk about components. Um, you have switches, okay? And there are different layer of switches. So the layer two switch, its job is to put together the data frame. So think of, um, so when you, when you are, let's say sending out an email, okay, uh, you basically start with connections, right? And then accessing the internet, logging in and be able to do that. All of that requires some kind of data frame to really set that up and send it through. At home, when you're using your wireless router, your wireless router does some of this already, okay? In the larger environment, you would use the switches. The cool thing with the switch in a large enterprise environment, in a large business, is that we can actually use it to really see who's connected, right? Um, you know, who's sending what, because it, it used the physical address, the MAC address to communicate and say that's the, the system that's sending the information across the network. The switch, its job at the end of the day is to get the packet to the right system. The router just gets it to the network. The switch gets it to the sub part of the network, the segment, we call that the segment of the network. And some of the question, some of the switch is actually functioning at a higher level, routing and switch. So if you're looking at your wireless router, your wireless router function has multiple functionality, right? It has the firewall capability, it has the routing capability, and so forth. Okay. So, um, Chris, that's fine. So for number one, what we want is we want to describe how the device, such as a laptop, a smartphone, connect to the internet from your home network. Okay, um, so if you're looking at like mobile devices, laptop or smartphone, it, at home, you're using a wireless router, which connects to your internet service provider, which then connects to other networks and then ultimately autonomous system. And the route it, the, the, these routers it will route the request and reply of your web traffic from, an end, from the endpoints to the destination port. 
Okay. For two, three types, three of, types hosts of hosts in your local area network. network. Hi, Patrick. I think Hi. you're unmute and I could hear something in the back. Okay. Um, so three types of hosts will be server, right? PC, smartphone, tablet, IoT, uh, or it could be terminal. So like sales terminal or kiosk, right? Like if you're looking at the airport, all of those are connected. That way you can print out your flight ticket, you can, you know, print out your luggage or even purchase services for the flight. Um, so those are kiosks or when you go to the store, right? Like uh, <laughs> long ago, I used to service uh, Coinstar and Coinstar is still around. Every time I see it, I laugh because um, I remember I used to reboot those systems all the time. And this is from like the days that we used to run CDs. So those are kiosks too, right? Like people can go touch the screen, put the coins in, dump it. Um, and then, or even like those red box machine to rent um, DVDs and such or Blu-ray. You see those, people still use those even though optical uh, drives are becoming obsolete. Um, so, uh, you know, you have smart vending machines that are connected. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit other countries, you see all of these things connected. So um, those are nodes, right? And the way that we see hosts a lot of the times is more on complex systems. But, you know, it depends on the type of business that you're working in. For three, let's touch on servers. So... Uh, network components also entail servers and servers would have operating systems. Um, the majority of the company would use Microsoft and Microsoft operating system, you would have to get licenses for the user, the users that are accessing, that's part of the server. Um, so if you have 200 employees, you have to have seats for those. So for MVC or RCCD, right? their license is large scope because they have so many students, faculty, employees, et cetera. So we would have something like email servers, okay? And for Microsoft environment, you would probably hear Exchange. So that's the, the, the type of email servers is Microsoft. Um, and then you do have some company using Linux based email server, very rare. I think, um, you know, it started to become a little bit more in popularity, but uh, many companies use Microsoft Exchange. Um, well, you would have database server and database is often tied with web, uh, you know, web app, stuff like that. Authentication server that would be for user accounts and, you know, in the Microsoft environment that would be active directories and such. Um, application server, its job is to provide applications for the users so they can download, install, um, even on a small scale like browser, anything that's application related. Sometimes companies would tie one physical system that would have many different roles. Um, they would have web and application server combined, um, stuff like that. But, you know, moving away from single point failure, you don't want that to happen. And I think the book touches on, you know, a little bit of that is to make sure that we have throughput and not tie to one physical system. Um, even on the virtual machine level, sometimes you do have, you know, attack that's coming from the virtual machine. And, uh, and then you have domain name server. This, its job is to resolve the, the IP address to the actual domain information. That means that it could be, you know, microsoft.com, um, and every system that's connected to your network or authenticated would be part of the domain. Then you got DHCP that would be assigning IP addresses. And then your web server, everyone uses this. You see it all the time when you type in a website, 
right? So it's service, it gives you the page and the resources that you need from a, a, a certain website. Um, web servers, a lot of it's, they're very public, that's public front. And then sometimes you have the application on the front end too. Um, and then companies would put some of these servers also from the inside for their internal employees. Remote access servers, this allows people to work remotely. This is very popular now, as you know, because of COVID. Um, you know, they would use VPN to connect and then authenticate to, you know, their desktop or their systems or the network. And then they would get their files, access to files and, and services at their work. Um, print server, its job is just to manage and queue prints. So when you have a company that does a lot of printing, they would have print server. And print server doesn't have to be a print uh, a server OS. Virtualization server like Hyper-V, um, you know, vSphere, those are super common and you often see them at the data center. Um, if you work at data centers, that is like, like AWS, stuff like that, or even small scale data center, you see virtualization server all the time because that saves money um, and that's what they use. Question? No question? No question. Okay. Okay. So one second. Hi, Patrick. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I could hear you. It was okay. a little echoey. I'm sorry. Did you have a sorry. question? Yes. My question was um, for virtualization server. Sorry. Basically, uh -huh. that's a virtual machine that's been uh, set up for running mini ser like virtual servers. Like if I make a virtual box, I can SSH to it. Would that be a virtual server? So, so the virtualization servers, it's job, it has the storage capability, of course, and then yes, it you can create different virtual machine inside it instances. Uh, so you can have different VMs, um, and then you would be able to re have those virtual machine be used by different groups of people or by different systems. So those system, they need to connect to that server to be able to access the virtual machine. So it's centralized it. Because right now at home, you, you basically run one virtual box, right? For that one system, right? Yes. But, but you can have many instances from that one server. You can have thousands, you can have hundreds, depends on the capability of that server, okay? So the, uh, my machine, I've been running nested virtual machines. Would that be considered like multiple within each other where they're inside each other? So all you're doing is you actually using a hypervisor, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a software and then inside it, you have a, a outside, you have a host and then inside it, you would have a virtual machine. But, but if, if you, if you service, even though if you can have multiple virtual machines from that one computer, right, can you run it simultaneously? Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you are able to run it simul, now, if you're hosting it simultaneously, you, your system is just a host. The virtualization server, they use the software where you can actually pause, right? Like a, a, a certain virtual machine, and then you can go from one virtual machine to another. If you ever use Practice Lab, Practice mm -hmm. Lab uses a virtualization server. And the role that they use is the Hyper-V. So what that is, is when you go to the virtual machine and you do your lab, another student will have their own virtual machine and do their lab. And if, you know, it might pause it at a certain point and then come back to it later. Okay. So it is elevated in a higher role. The only difference between yours and, and the virtualization server is your host capability, your, your, your um, hypervisor capability is less, okay? The, the hypervisor capability for the level of the server is much higher, right? They are, it's able to manage a lot of instances. That means it requires more RAM. It requires more storage. Okay. That's the true difference. Okay. Interesting. Uh -huh. And then, uh, so 
another set of appliances that we need to take a look at, I mentioned your switch, your router, your firewall, intrusion prevention system, intrusion detection system. Sometimes these are all in one appliance, sometimes they're not, okay? And, uh, you know, it depends on the vendor, of course. So you would refer to vendor, you know, information about different things, capability. Okay. All right. So while we're on that, I want to come back to this. <clears throat> so this gives you a little bit more information. So the difference between the switch and the router is that the switch, its job is to put together the data frame, right? And then forward it to the router. The router, its job is to route, right? The data from the network to the outside and then from the outside back to the, the, the inside network. Why would they have a router inside the network? Well, because what if you have little networks, right? Like virtual private network, <laughs> like, you know, uh, to be able to make sure that they communicate because you would set them up as different subnets. Um, so the router guide and directs data using packets. And so it operates at layer three of the OSI model. The switch often starts at two. Now we have layer four and layer five switch all in one, right? Um, when I started working long ago, it, there was only layer two. And, and then they start releasing layer three switch, which acts as a router and a switch. And then now you have a layer four switch. You know, layer four switch is often used for VoIP. Okay. Uh, so you would see those. And then now you also have layer five switch. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's advancing. So here it talks a little bit more about routing. Um, router routing technology is a class on its own. I do have a class that was created called routing and switching um, and we will offer it later, but there's different routers. There's the core router generally used by your service provider, right? Like your ISP, those are more industrial routers and it's able to have larger bandwidth. Um, now the majority of the routers are fiber based. And then you have the edge router, what we call the, the gateway. That's when you look at the diagram earlier, that router that's at the edge of the network, that's the edge router. And the edge router, you can optimize it to connect and distribute data to the end user. So you can configure it to specific areas. So for example, I have two departments in my company. One department is sales and the other department is human resource, let's say. And the sales department require more bandwidth because possibly they have to have web customer, they have to market, you know, et cetera. They have to process sales. They have to access the database um, via the web, okay? I would, I can, I can adjust that, right? I can set them up as two sub networks and then I can have more dedicated bandwidth that's gonna be to the sales department. And I can also use load balancing to be able to, to offset that, okay? So you can adjust that and, and take a look at it. And so for, for MVC, right, like a college, the student side is going to need more bandwidth compared to the staff side, right? Um, Sometimes if they don't manage it, they just say, oh, okay, just traffic, traffic being used and that's it, sent in and out, but you can optimize the bandwidth. You can reduce from one end and, and, and you know, have more on the other. Um, so that's the edge router information. There's the distribution router. You would use this for receive data from the edge router. So before it gets to the rest of your network, remember what I said about the rack, right? Um, if, you, if they have a distribution router, it's gonna then 
go from the edge to the distribution router and then it's going to get divided. Okay. So these you would see more physical ethernet connections because then now it's going to get more inside compared to the edge that's going to be interchanging between you know your ISP and your network. And then you have the wireless that would be combining with different components. It's often used for small business and also small business and also for um, home. Then you have virtual router. This is software based. And basically it allows you to virtualize it. So use for simulation purposes using to make sure, you know, to set it where it looks like, you know, it's a virtualized network, it's a virtualized environment. Um, AWS does some of this, you see cow company uses some of this, some company that owns some of the data center or even have more complex network, they would have some, some virtual router set up. Um, and some appliance actually has that capability too. So, it's a physical router along with another role that you can use. But what will happen is if they attack that router, it takes away both roles. So you gotta be careful about that, okay? Um, and then I added some additional, some additional appliances there. Okay. So what type of data center, what type, I'm sorry, oh yeah. This question is right. What type of data center is used for streaming video, gaming, and or online radio? So let's talk about data center. Okay. So it is more frequent now that we will work with data center. Um, even even either you work inside the data center or you you work with the people from the data center. Um, so we have to understand different type of data center. So you have the enterprise data centers. Um, that will be very large. They would have mail servers, database, web, uh, you name it, they have it, right? And even if you're looking at like Amazon, Facebook, those are large enterprise scales, very, very large. And they might have multiple data centers. So um, this would, they would have a central location where their servers become the main distribution frame. Uh, that's where all the data comes from. That's where the data is managed. Before, people used to put this in like headquarter, but now a lot of times it's better just to get a cloud company to manage your infrastructure. So, you know, they would just lease the equipment from, you know, Amazon, that's the most common one, or Google um, or Microsoft, and then be able to handle that. Now, enterprise works with three layers, okay? Access layers, distribution layer, and the core layer. Okay, so that means that access is going to be accessibility to the systems, the data, the resources. Distribution is going to break it down to the sub level, and then the core layer is to the sub part of the branches. So there's not all one size fit all for everybody. It's every business is different, even though it's the same type of business. So Second thing, cloud data centers. So IaaS is infrastructure as a service and you have the three big players, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, okay? Now, those are the companies that provide service for infrastructure as a service along with other cloud services, of course. Um, but I, I included something here for you to kind of show you about Facebook, Facebook and social media company and even Google, their campuses for their for their data centers, this is actual picture, right? Um, so $65 million for the infrastructure upgrade for the Microsoft, so that kind of give you the scale. And if you ever watched a video for the Facebook data center, their technician have six minutes to do a hot swap on a, on a hard drive. Okay, so that means that when the hard drive is down, it notifies the technician, they go there and they swap it out. They, ha they have six minutes to do that. Um, and for this one, so this, this center is in Tennessee. 
This one is in Sweden, and I think this one is $180 million. Um, so there's a company that owns a data center that's hiring as part of the apprenticeship is Converge One. And Converge One had for, hired many of my former students. Um, they're near Ontario, uh, Rancho Cucamonga area. And so they have a smaller scale, of course, but they have data centers that, that service many, many businesses. So that would be the local one that you would see competing with Amazon, of course. But um, so here you would, it talks about racks and racks of things, of servers, um, and then the company owns it. We, you know, business just simply lease it. So the big thing about the data center and the scale for the cloud is that you see redundancy that it, it's intertwined and it's connecting across because like they, people tell you that when you put, when you have web presence on social network, like Facebook, right? It's not only to one server, you know, that it's to thousands of servers because that your data gets replicated across the world and it's no joke. So, you know, they have at least 16 data centers from my knowledge, okay? And so e inside each of the data center, their system is interconnected to duplicate your data so many ways. So, you know, it's really difficult to really completely remove trace of somebody once they have web presence. So that way you can see the scale. Then your edge data center, yep. Millions of servers within in their network, right? And then if you're looking at one locations that could be thousands or in the hundred of thousands. So, and there's big money going into that. Okay, so for the edge data center, this is basically designed for network latency and the term latency means slow down or delay, okay? So to, if, if, if you have too much traffic coming in, you will have bottleneck right there, okay? And because if it hits the, once it leaves from the edge router and go to the distribution router, if you have that one point, think of it like five lanes going into one lane, right? You're gonna get that one area that's gonna be stuck. So for data center, what they would do is they would set up an edge data center that would just redistribute the traffic. So that way there's no cost, there's no bottleneck area. So it's gonna load balance out, it's gonna distribute out the load and be able to handle all the requests, all the traffic, all the things, especially web servers. So the redundancy, a lot of the time we compensate, uh, we, we, when, when, remember this picture above, right? Redundancy, sometime we, we would have to compensate speed. But there are ways that we can work around that now where it would not be too much of a latency across our network, especially when you're looking at data centers. So the people, the engineers that design data centers, the group of engineers that do that, you know, for something like Facebook, they have to really take a look at how the design and, and integrating the components that would make it super efficient, right? And they monitor it all the time. So, so you, for the, yes. I have, sorry, quick question. For the, uh, you know, optimizations they've done, is it because of the hardware? Or is it because of the new types of uh, redundancy that they created? Because I've heard both. they use SSDs for caching now. Yes, so it's be both. That. Because, you know, hardware is, is super affordable, right? Instead of doing the actual HDD hot swap, you would use solid state drive. Also, you have more RAM capability in server systems, right? Yeah. Uh, you have better connection with fiber. Of course, they're all fiber and they would have dedicated fiber, okay? So yeah. when you say, when we, when we have fiber, we use shared fiber at home, meaning that you share that fiber line with your neighbor and your neighborhood. Yes. It's kind of like driving on a public freeway, right? But when you do a dedicated fiber, that's like, that's like, toll road and only you you're the only car in that road and no one else is in it so so when you have that ownership you can do a lot with the optimization for the traffic okay mm -hmm. 
compared to if you share because when when you share with your neighbor if if they're using a lot of the bandwidth that also compensate they say you know that this is why your traffic fluctuate because it's never going to be the same but with dedicated fiber you are going to have a pretty regulated even when you have you would estimate it for heavy traffic and it you know it would still be consistent um so you know and then in addition, you can run your own dedicated fiber line. So Google does that, right? Facebook does that. A lot of these companies does that. So yeah, yeah, technology changed drastically on hardware and software level on how we do networking. Um, cool. Okay. And I, you know, throughout my 15 years of teaching this, I see drastic change throughout, you know, like things that we do now that is, I wish I had that, but, you know, it's, it's great for you as the next set of, you know, technical people that's going to be in the field, you're going to see a whole new horizon, right? And that's always also going to be changing. So um, for the next question, it asks you, it says the type of sender that's used for streaming video, gaming, and online radio. So when you, you're heavily on the media side, right? Like uh, then you want it to consider both edge and enterprise or one or the other. And so uh, let's say that you win a huge lottery jackpot and you wanted to open your data center, right? How would you start doing that? Well, if you wanted to have a gaming company, then you have to start thinking about an enterprise level data center um, or you know, incorporating some of the edge data center design. And then if you are a communication company, um, in general, you would probably have an edge data center, stuff like that. So uh, streaming video for media base, we would consider these, okay. Okay, any questions so far? Sorry, no Python today, right? But next week, <laughs> we're gonna make sure we understand networking first. Okay, next, talk about OSI model, okay? OSI model is emphasized in Network Plus. Um, in Security Plus, there's a little bit of it related to protocol, A plus touches on protocols too. So OSI, there are seven layers and the author for this text, he talks about using the TCP IP model reference so TCP, uh, there are two type of model, three layers and four layers. All they did was they combined some of the OSI layers into one and then grouped that into two, three or four layers. So um, just real quick for you, I'm gonna give you the super cliff note, okay? Because this is usually like two, a chapter or, or at least a week on just OSI for Network Plus. So, you have the, the first layer start from the bottom here, okay? And I have a little saying how I memorize it. People don't need to see purple alligator. And so physical data link transport sections, presentation and application. Um, so the physical is where there are bits. This is where your cable see the signal, okay? When you're connecting, that's the first layer. When when data transmission, let's say that you you have you sending you you connecting to an email account, right? And you're sending out email. When you have data that needs to be communicated between your computer and the email server, then the data links start to take to go into place, right? That's the second layer. And then when it leaves your network, right? Remember, we got to connect to Google, Gmail, or you know, Outlook.com. Then the third layer start to take effect because it needs to route from your computer to the email server. Then once it gets routed out and you know to receive, in order to make sure that it gets there, the transport layer is handling that. It got to make sure TCP. Its job is to make sure that it gets there. And it does the three-way acknowledgement, right? Did you receive it? And then the 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 destination said, I received it. Okay, confirm. Yes. Then it's gonna send. Yeah, okay? I just haven't had time to put it all away. Um question. Yeah. So um I think the Dennis runs so depending on the engagement reports. Okay. Um, so 
Okay. And so she ran for um, Midland. And Sorry, I think he was on unmute. Um, and then once you have session, session is when once you establish the communication to exchange information. So once the confirmation takes place, the session goes into place. Okay, so that means that I now communicate it with the email server. So first I connect, right? I, I communicate, I, I need to connect and say, oh, I'm sending this request out. It routes it out, it confirms it, it established that communication, right? And then what it does is it's then gonna decompress data, encrypt, encoding that's in the presentation process. And then the application is where I could see it on my Gmail, okay? So when it pulls email to your inbox, all these layers take place, okay? So when, when you know, whenever you visit a website, whenever you accessing your email, whenever you log into Canvas, when you submit your assignments, all of these things take place. And sometimes it goes back and forth, it jump back and forth, okay? But to start is, you know, signal connection, at the bit level, that's like Wi-Fi or you know Ethernet signal, and then it goes all the way up. Okay, so now you kind of have a sense on how that works. And so this been around for a long time. Okay, so you would see that. So when we say layer three, what do we mean? Layer three in the OSI layer. So your router operates here. Your switch operate layer two. Your cable and ethernet operates at layer one. Sessions, all of these ups are for communication and then application is your browser operates here at layer seven and six. Okay, because it has to de, and you know, because if it's encoded or, you know, for data decompression, the, the browser, okay, and then what the browser ties to a website, that's usually session presentation and application all in one. So answer in the next question. When a user connecting to a LAN to access email, which I should rephrase that, sorry. When a user is connecting I was sleepy when I wrote this. Uh, which layer of OSI model is utilized? So all seven, I, you start with the physical cable connection, data link for data frame transfer, network for routing packet, transport for reliable transmission, session to exchange data back and forth, presentation for data translation and encoding, and application for interfacing through software. I didn't want to use the term application again. So, uh, okay. And that will go from one, I should number these so you can see. And if you understand that, that's a, so, uh, one of the primary area for Network Plus as well. We only have a few more questions to go through the rest of the content. So, um, you know, we have about 30 minutes, so it's pretty good. Any questions about OSI? Okay. So when we use Python, okay, a lot of the times we can track things in these area. Okay, so now if you if you do stuff like for automation, reboot systems, stuff like that, yeah, maybe it's at the lower level for the physical and stuff, but yeah, it's going to require all of these to communicate with the system, of course, but your scripting, you know, the majority would be from like, I'm sorry, from three in here. Okay, 
the differences between transfer control, uh, transmission control protocol and UDP. Like I mentioned earlier, TCP is, so my analogy for this in all my classes is TCP is like the UPS delivery person that makes you sign when you receive your packet and gives you the tracking and information throughout, okay? So UPS would say, oh, the package is on its way, right? And then when it gets to your door, they ring the doorbell, you have to sign it and say, oh, and then it sends you an, a message that says you have received your package, right? So um, TCP does three-way acknowledgement. Are you ready to receive, right? And then you have to say, yes, I'm ready. And then it's going to say, here it is. And then you said, I received. So there's three, three acknowledgement happening. UDP doesn't care. Says, here it is. You get it, you get it, you don't, you don't. So it's like the person, like my postman, postwoman, postperson drives by my house and just throw the package, not even getting out of the car, just toss it and leave. <laughs> so um, TCP gives you reliable data transfer, which compensates with time. So it is slower. And the connection is oriented because it needs to make sure that that connection takes place. UDP is unreliable. It doesn't care whether it gets there or not. It is faster and it's often used for media. I like that analogy because it makes sense. Uh, my media servers <laughs> use UDP and I was wondering what makes it decide which one it is. Now I know. Right. You know, the majority, okay. So the book, and if you read a lot of the things online, textbook, whatever, they're going to tell you that UDP is old, it's dated, um, even though they update the protocol suite, right? Protocol is just a set of rules that we agree to use, right? Yes. It's made for hardware design and, and development. But but the majority of the, the traffic that you see in all networks is UDP because it's fast. So this is why on the security side, we take advantage of that, right? From a perspective of the attacker, they take advantage of the UDP in that UDP is not reliable, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when they listen in on the traffic, they're trying to say, oh, what protocol are you using, right? Um, and then, and then on, the, on the side of the network and the administration, we take advantage of it as, as fast as convenient, and you know it gets the job done, uh, availability throughput. Okay, so you know. Give also, or take. one one question too: uh, is TCP and UDP aren't the only ones, right? Because I've heard of NX, and I think I've seen it before in one of the yes. slides. Yes, but but the majority your common networks, like at close to ninety percent of your traffic, will be under these two. Yeah. So TCP encompasses right, a set of other protocols, and then UDP encompasses other, a set of protocols, and sometimes they're mixed, right, like, if you're looking at, at HTTPS, that's TCP, right, it's yeah. under that category, and then you, if you're looking at other type of protocol, that will be under UDP, less UDP know. then, yeah, so, so basically, it's, it's a, it's also a category of other protocols, that would so when when you when you see the type of protocol you say oh that's support and that's because it's reliable udp type not that's the port and it's unreliable right so but it's fast so now you you kind of see the two category and how that's used yeah okay ports and protocols is our life so so, you know, you have, they are part of the, the, the job function. So you got to make sure that you know that well, common ports. Okay. Um, the purpose of your internet protocol, its job is only to do what? Addresses and routing. And so layer three is internet protocol. It is connection less oriented. It has, you know, it's basically ties to address and that's it. Um, we use IP addresses for everything, okay? Everything that's connected. Um, either version four or version six companies now move away from version four, um, but you do see version four being used internally. 
uh, because you know administrators they don't like changes too much because it, it requires a lot of reconfiguration so um, adaptable to version six sometimes you get a mix and question okay that's fine Steve okay so when we look at IP addresses, so here's the topology on how that's used for the, your data flow. So before we get into IP addresses, so here you can see application, application, transport to transport, and then the lower ones for communication. So now um, when we look at addresses you have to know that there are two type of address your public and your private ip your private ip is used for inside your company only when you connect to the internet there's a public ip and that public ip is seen by as by you know your service provider you know so all your mobile devices and things like that have the public IP, so it's connecting to your, your uh, service provider and they acquired that from, you know, from the, the, uh, the organization that released it. So a, a communication company would get a list of IP addresses that they can use and that's how they, they are able to distribute it to the subscriber. Um, now, when you have a telephone number, telephone number is just tied to the actual phone or the device for that line. But at the same time, IP address on the digital aspect is really pinpointed that that device is part of that network and it's connected to that net network. So, um, so when you run IP config or IF config at home, that's your private IP, okay? Um, and if you wanted to know your public IP, that's, you know, through, that would be your, your service provider that they would have your public IP. Some router would have two things noted, like this is your public IP and this is your private IP. Um, but, you know, internally you only see private IP. Okay, client server model, this is used everywhere, enterprise, low scale. Um, basically you use a centralized resource uh, model where you would use that to distribute data, um, to authenticate, to you know service uh, web pages, to give email, etc. Um, now this require high higher hardware specifications and manage. It requires also operating system software that's different, um, and you know of course manpower that's going to contribute to that. Network suite. So protocol, we touch on that. I mentioned a little bit of that. This is good to know, okay? Especially if you wanted to get more into like scripting for security, monitoring traffic. So here's TCP. And this is layer four. Remember it's for transport. And so a TCP header contains, it is 160 bits. Okay, think of this as your mail label on your package that you're trying to ship out to your friend or your family, okay? And TCP has a larger header file. So on it, it would have source, where is it coming from, destination, where is it going to, and the ports number. So this is just a number that's assigned to a specific protocol for the connection, okay? And it has a sequence number, an acknowledgement number, a control flag, and a checksum. This is why it's reliable. A sequence number allows the packet to reassemble in order. So when your packet gets to the web server or you know wherever that you're trying to send that to, it has to restructure because when data is sent, it's disorganized, it's not in order. That's how, because we want it fast. But when it gets there, it used that sequence number to restructure. And it, it also, if you have multiple packets, 
it's able to identify what's following, okay? The acknowledgement number is the confirmation number that's gonna say that it's received and because the, the, the connection is established. The control flag allows us to see multiple and also you know, to make sure that there's, uh, it's not gonna be corrupted or, or lost. Then you got the checksum and basically to make sure that it's in its entirety. Now, does it mean that, that, that they cannot do packet stuffing? Probably not, depending on the type of protocol that you use. So now what, what the, the form of attack that they do is to intercept and then capture the packet to see what it's like and then to stuff it, right? To modify the content in it, to change it, to edit it, and then send it to the destination. Um, so definitely different approach in how we look at security. So this is what the, the packet would look like, okay? I'm sorry, the header, that's what it would look like. Now, there's a little bit of example on the host-to-host -host communication. And TCP connection is managed by your OS, by the socket that represents the endpoint. Because your operating system really is <clears throat> the software that's going to communicate with the, the hardware that's going to trans transmit that, right? Which is your Ethernet or your wireless adapter. Um, so when you are when when you are using all of this, right, there got to be some some form of uniform control. And IANA, they assign IP addresses and they assign port numbers. They designate that for different services for the common ports. Um, and yes, administrator can use uncommon ports, but IANA is in charge of that. Okay, let's take a look at, um, so here a little bit more on TCP. The differences between TCP and UDP, you will find this on page eight. So when you're looking at traffic, when we're scanning traffic or we're, uh, we're monitoring traffic on the TCP, you would see three things. If you ever use Wireshark, you see the SYN, SYN ACK and ACK, okay? That's basically the three things that needs confirmation. To sync, sync acknowledgement and acknowledgement, right? Are you ready to receive? I'm sending and it's received, okay? And then it has the final message, okay? Act is the final message. So any questions regarding TCP and UDP? And I'll touch a little bit more on UDP right now, but so answer the next one. Uh, we talked about how it's unreliable for, for UDP, it's faster, and then internet is for addresses. So a little bit more on UDP. UDP, operates also in layer four, the header is much smaller, 64 bits, okay? And um, UDP is older, it's been around for a while. We, we used to use UDP for frame relay. So before the network, the way it is now, uh, we used to install frame relay and frames which use X821 uh, standards. So it's a little bit different than what you see now. Definitely not fast, but faster for most businesses. Um, ATM machines, uh, a lot of like the enterprise and big larger corporations, they would use frame relay. That was when I started um, coming into the field as a network technician. So here is the UDP header. Notice that you don't have all the other stuff. Okay, because there's no reliability in that. Uh, it only have where it's coming from, where it's going to, the length, right? And then the checksum. It doesn't need the sequence. So this is why when you watch video online, 
and things like that, right? It's it's uh, unpacking as it arrives. TCP, it waits for everything to arrive and then unpack, okay? Um, so UDP, it just drops it in as it arrives, okay? Like you do, video conferencing is some of that too. Um, and then, so here, you know, multimedia, streaming, Skype, stuff like that. IP, uh, we touch on IP using addresses, used for addresses. So I wanted to show you how to read this if you're new to it. This is a 32-bit version four address. We use the period, which we call dot notation. Every number here represents eight bits. Together, you have 32 bits. This is the eight bits is also called octet, okay? So with the version four, when you run, you know, IP config, right? If you're using version four at home, you might see the 192 and it's broken into different class, A, B, and, and C. And you know the other classes outside of that is for government and research uses only for the version four, but this is class C as it is the smallest group that this is why it's used for home. Class A is the largest. Um, class C, you can have more subnet with less systems and so forth. I will not go into IP subnetting right now. That will be a different class, but that kind of give you the idea. So in version four, there are two piece in the addresses, okay? You have the IP address, which is like this, or sometime it could be like this, 10.10.1.1, something like that. And when you see the dot one right here, usually that's like a router. And those addresses don't change. It's not dynamic. It stays the same throughout. So that way people can still connect to it years and years end. Then the second part, you would see another address and this is called a subnet mask, okay? A subnet mask is like the zip code or the area code. It, it gets, this is used by the router to really determine what subnet that belongs to. Okay, so when, when, when the packets get to the router, it's gonna say, oh, that's the subnet, send it over to this segment. And then the switch job is to take that and put it to your system. So your wireless router at home, it does all of that. It brings it in from the outside and then it breaks it down to which system in your network has, requires it, needs that reply. Okay, um, where in, in a business environment, if they have a le level two switch, the switch job is to take whatever gets to, the, to it and then it's gonna break it down to say, oh, okay, send it to system number 84 in this segment. Okay. And sometimes you would see that it, it uses this. And the way that you, how the router sees it, you see this 255. If you ever know how to do the binary conversion, right? The bits are on, so it's all on, 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 on. So when it sees all those bits are on for the first three octet, it's gonna say, oh, that's the network. Because this, this the 255 here, it represents network, network, network. And this is for class C. Okay, so, and then class A, you only see the 255000. So the zero here, just it's null out for the host. So that it would know based on this, which network that is. Okay, and that was part of the IP version four. IP version six, there is some subnet for the version six. But version six header looks a little bit different. They simplify it and yes, we will eventually run out of version six and then we'll move on to the next one. But uh, you notice that there is the version number, right? 
but version four has all of these additional component to really identify for, you know, as that is the, the address source destination for the version the six, it just, it, a lot of it is automated. So it just need like, oh, there's a flow label, the length and the header, and that will take care of everything else. And then of course, where it's going to and where it's coming from. Okay. So this is, he this these headers are used to really transmit data across all your systems across the world. Networking is really cool. This is how we're able to communicate. This is how I'm able to do Zoom right now. So, okay. There's another protocol called NAT. This is used a lot in networking and security for translating private to public and public to private IP. So your router does the network address translation. It takes that and it's gonna say, oh, this means this. Okay, and yes, you can do some NAT modification. Uh, there's some form of, you know, attack or configuration that relates to this. So, but on virtual machine, you can also set it where it converts the virtual machine address to your regular local area network address. And then that gets converted by the router to the public address to, to even access internet on your virtual machine. Okay, there are different version for that. Of course, there's version four and then NAT6 is for version six. Okay, anything on the networking part? So the last questions for the network is number nine. The purpose of network address translation is to translate private to IP, public IP and public to private. Okay. And then lastly, just review for Python. I took a little bit of the snapshot from the book and I put it in there as I know that some of you just finished the Python class recently and also last semester, you know, I mean the fall. So, um, you know, starting with knowing how to use variable operators and it talks about Python is essential to, you know, the scripting and automation and it's because it's flexible. It has a lot of different libraries. So for uh, Python, Python uses the interpreter and we use C Python for this. There's also interactive shell. So that way you can, you know, type in something and then it's gonna output showing on shell. So you would see a lot of the text display via shell. And Python, we don't have to put in the type, but it does use type like int, float, complex, bool. And we also need to know how to use sequences. Okay, like string manipulation, remember slicing, all that good stuff that we learn using a list, tuple, range. And then in the case of mapping, that will be dictionary and sets. Question? I have a question. Yeah. So for the Python, you said that they're using scripts. Is that for the servers you're talking about? For the we would we would we would script and then we can use it for server, we can use it for switches, we can use it for router. So um, we would we would use Cisco viral to simulate a network connection. Okay, and then we would script for that. Um, so would it not be because I, I was st starting to study bash is it better just to learn Python instead then is bash you, you should replaced? study bash uh, okay. bash is okay uh, you know bash for Linux and then you got you, you can do like PowerShell Windows using C you can even use Python with it you can use you can use Python with a lot of things 
but a lot of the network appliances uh, don't have PowerShell, right? Yeah. Uh, they have command line. And in command line, you can add a file and run that file, right? Yes. Because and because CLI is very it uh, on the appliances. There's some limited storage, so we cannot put a lot of things in it. We cannot install another application on it. Very rare. If it has an interface, it's very limited. Mm -hmm. um, so what you can do is you can write a small file, and then run that small file. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, so we will we will work with some of the libraries and things like that. So this kind of give you a little bit of review and then also using none. I know I saw some of you use this on your project, right? And uh, none type denotes that there's no value, um, nothing, okay? So you can use it in methods, uh, the arguments for the method if there's nothing to be passed um, to, and then you know, you can also use it in so many different ways. I saw a lot of different ways that you can include none in your program. It depends on what your program is designed to do. Mapping. Uh, so this refers to the dictionary where we can map data to the actual key. And dictionary simply is a, a multidimensional list. So Python, the cool part is to use dictionary and instead of using list within list within list, right? Um, so it is definitely readable for the human. It's easy to see. And, you know, you can do something with dictionary in Python like inventory of your connected systems and it would do, okay? So, you know, there's some use with the dictionary with that. And some example, and then we will also use sets. So when do you use sets for networking? Well, what if you wanna assign IP addresses to a bunch of printers? Um, you can, because sets have to be unique, right? Like each item has to be unique and they are unordered. Well, you can, you can set up a set and then you can use that set to contain your IP addresses or even, you know, names, different things. So, um, there's used with sets. Operators using arithmetic operators and then also using membership operator, using um, logical operators. I only took a few screenshots in here. And then we also will use flow control, if, l if, l if, else. Um, while and for. Python doesn't use do while, so just use while, for, if, l, if. Okay. And lastly, we will either import in the module that was created, built in already, or we will write our own modules and create packages. The only thing um, if you took my Java class, you're familiar with package where you have to make a folder, name it exactly the name of your package, and then use that, right, to be able across multiple modules. So in Python, you need to first create a folder and then Make sure that it's the same name as the namespace of your package. Okay, so if you name, uh, like in, in my example for my Java class, we use a book pack, right? So the folder has to be named book pack as the package is book pack. Okay, and you can do packages for a lot of different things. For, for like a regular program, we can use it for taking, you know, for custom customer transaction, account registration, all kinds of different things. But in this case, we would use it for different resources related to networking. Then second step is to create init file and you can simply have it empty. So it has to have an init.py file in the directory, otherwise it would not know that it's a package. 
And the third step is, I don't know why I put please, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, so here, what you have to do is you have to basically use your source file, your module with it, okay? And so the example that we use here is the subtract pi. I think I meant to put place. <laughs> place the module source file in the directory. That will be the answer for 10. Okay. Sorry about that. It's been uh, a very long winter and also an interesting first week, second day. <laughs> but all I can do is laugh about it and move on. Um, okay, anything, any questions? Okay, so that's it for this session. Uh, please, if you have time this week, look over the material. If you can get the textbook or look through the notes. Um, if you have the book, please read chapter two. Um, type your name into the chat and I will see you uh, next week if you don't show up for office hours. Okay. See you next week, Professor. Sorry Bye. to hear about your yeah, relative, that's but I mean, there's a lot of people who've been losing their 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 lives due to COVID and it's horrible. Yeah, that's okay. Bye. Yeah, I you know um, I lost um, one grandmother last year to COVID. She was 99, and you know that was the one I grew up with. And then my grandmother in Virginia, uh, I'm not that close to her, but I love her. Um, she mm -hmm. is 91. So they lived a full life. Um, you know, I talked to my mom about it. She's very, she's devastated, but you mm. know, everybody, everything has an end. So, yes? Not because of COVID-19? No, she, she had some heart condition. And I think also some of it has to do with, um, she's sad that she's gonna be in a nursing home. So she gave up, she just stopped eating. And oh, wow. so, yeah, so it caused other issues, but you know, that's, or she said she couldn't eat. Um, yeah. yeah, so, you know, um, I haven't seen her since I graduated in 2000. Well, I walked in 2014, I finished my dissertation in the end of 2013. So I haven't seen her for a good while, but my mother, she, she went there a few months ago. Um, so if, you know, flying into DC right now is a little bit sketchy for me too, but they mm -hmm. request that you test and then fly within the three days. Um, so I, I haven't even gotten an appointment for vaccine. Hopefully RCC will offer vaccine. Um, and so we can get vaccinated at least the first part of it, and then I can get tested and then I can go. So I, you know, I'm healthy. I don't have any problem. I hardly ever get sick. So That's even though funny. I don't sleep that much, <laughs> <laughs> but when I sleep, like I can sleep anywhere. So like I can literally sit in a chair and fall asleep. So pretty easy. That's lucky at least. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where you fall asleep while doing these, uh, these assignments? Well, hopefully I'm, when I get older, I'm not one of those people that just talk to you and the next thing they, you know, they're sleeping. Right. And so that would be funny. No offense. That would be very funny to see you like that. I don't know. Telling, telling us how to do something, the next thing you know. Oh, well, you know, let's just leave I will her retire be. <laughs> before before that point. But you know, I would probably lose my memory before that. I think um, you know because it, it's my my other grandmother that passed. She she had she suffered from dementia for a long time, uh, and so you know I started to see some sign of it. But it's also because of lack of sleep or just busy. Mm -hmm. um, but they said to exercise your brain every day, like read or do something different. Okay. Well, as far as exercising, doing 
uh, very intense stuff. I'm sure you do that every day with your job, <laughs> but it's different stress. things that might be a little tricky. Well, I do different things every day. I try and play puzzle games. That's <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Have a good one. I'll see you, you all later. Bye bye. Bye. Aiko, did you have a question for me? Yeah. Uh, do you teach? Uh, she has uh, my I teaching. I know. Has... I I don't teach CIS one. Uh, Larry Parsons, uh, Robert Loya. Yeah. I think Larry yeah. is good. Larry Parsons is really good. He teaches in the morning. Larry Parsons is my teacher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Her. Oh, he just tells you to read yeah. the book? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, uh, not, uh, not, not me the in Zoom. Uh, just uh, read the chapter. So I have to get to figure out uh, the men, right? The teacher is the men, right? <laughs> is it Larry Parsons or the Robert Lloyd? Yeah, Larry. Larry Passion. Okay. Yeah. Larry there, there are there are other teachers that teaches the class that meets in Zoom. I think Robert might be, and then uh, Mr. McQueed. Oh, I like to meet in Zoom. I don't okay. like to meet yeah. Chapter. Well, but some some people they can't because of their schedule. So oh. you know. If you want, you can change section right now, but you know, next week it will be harder. All you have to do is ask them for the ad code. Oh, but the, when I enroll this class, they tell, they tell me, they tell us this Zoom and they tell us the time. Yeah, so it, sometimes that would also be the instructor too, because it's online, you know, if it's regular me, it, I think he has like a, he has like a, a occasional meet or something like that. Um, even though it places the time. So I think what you should do is you should ask him, just say that, you know, he should have office hours, like one yeah. hour, yeah. but ask yeah, yeah. him if it's ever going to meet on zoom. If not, then find a section that meets on zoom. Maybe he's confused, but I'll email him and, and find out, but you know, it's supposed to have like the he, one. He told us uh, because uh, she told us the one, no, no certain time uh, meeting in Zoom. Uh, oh, okay. Has, uh, okay, then it's not. She has office hour. Okay, then and, what? If you want, if you want somebody that meets on Zoom, you should go and and sign up for a different section. Uh, the the downside of that is that they they're gonna you have to log in every time but the the you know so it's up to you yeah yeah and he he asked us to buy that access code they all do oh uh, they all do access mm -hmm. code they all do access code that class it all the faculty use that particular product okay yeah and unfortunately it's kind of expensive I, when I taught it at a different college, I didn't use that. I used my own material because it's like a hundred dollars. But um, I, I think the one that they asked you to buy is fifty dollars. I think, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So if you have financial aid, you can request for a book voucher, and then you can I don't use that. Well, maybe you can apply now that your husband is retired, right? Like he's retired no. since the summer. Not yet. No retired yet oh maybe by next this year he is by summer no he, is. he told me that he would i thought he is he retiring he always want to retire but the, but i know we, we have a house mortgage we have a car mortgage if we, oh, he, maybe when you when maybe when you start working then he can probably take time off you always dream <laughs> are you ready are you ready to to get some work this semester for because i saw that you signed up for cis 200 yeah um okay. i try to get some uh, experience uh, i try to get some part-time part job no full time okay job. yeah of course i think all students are so yeah just just uh you know work with jennifer and make sure that she's clear on what you need that you know, if you want part time, certain amount of hours before, before you know they started sending your stuff out to the employer. Jennifer is a Jennifer McDaniel. 
is a good one to work with. I work with her for that class. And then also let me know. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. okay. Take care. See you next week. See you. Bye. Bye.